Hello, welcome to The Drum. I'm Julia Baird. Coming up... A 99-year-old woman in an aged care facility is among 11 new cases of COVID in Victoria as concern over the outbreak grows. It takes a village, community and parents brought into the picture as the New South Wales government updates, updates the way we teach consent. And you said it, 76% of us think there is a lot of racism in Australia and if you're not of European descent, you've probably been on the receiving end. Joining me on the panel tonight, wellbeing advisor at the New South Wales Department of Education, Kylie Captain. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Former Sex Discrimination Commissioner and New South Wales Minister Prue Goward is back. Hello, Prue. Hi. In Melbourne, comedian and broadcaster Nazim Hussain making his much anticipated debut. Welcome. I, w I waited till lockdown to get on this show. <laughs> yeah. And in Canberra, Youth Ambassador Yasmin Tall. Always good to see you, Yas. Good to be with you. If you want to join in on Twitter, you just use the hashtag the drum, as always, and we are on Facebook too. Now, there is one question on the lips of Victorians tonight. Will this latest lockdown lift after the requisite seven days? 11 new coronavirus infections have been identified in the last 24 hours. And while those numbers may not sound too high, it's the ballooning numbers of close contacts and exposure sites that has health officials so concerned. The challenge ahead of us is a very, very significant one. In the past 24 hours, we've identified many more points of concern, um, in addition to the very worrying cases in uh, private aged care. We're also very concerned about the number of other high-risk exposure sites. As the Acting Premier has said, over the last seven days, we've also identified over 4,200 primary close contacts. We're continuing to see a very encouraging set of negative results come back. For those primary close contacts, over 77% of those identified have already returned a negative test result. Now, through all this, there are unwelcome pangs of deja vu. Three cases have now been connected to aged care, two among workers and one in a 90-year-old resident. Last year, 80% of COVID deaths in Victoria occurred in aged care facilities. And Victoria's Chief Medical Officer has made it clear that regulations that limit carers to working in one facility need to be stricter. It's a risk wherever it occurs. Um, it needs to be, there needs to be support and policy settings uh, to minimise that to the fullest extent possible. I understand that some uh, settings will have critical workforce issues uh, if people can't move between settings, but the risk is manifest uh, and uh, it needs to be minimised to the fullest extent possible. For now, the federal government has requested that workers stick to one facility, but that's a request. It's not currently mandatory. Yasmin, I want to go to you first of all, because you're normally in Victoria um, and, and, and you're now in Canberra. How is it kind of watching it from a distance when it's just, you know, such an anxious prospect for so many? Oh, I think every single time this happens, it brings back flashbacks as to what happened last year. And I think myself and so many other people are still trying to process actually what last year was. It was yeah. such a bizarre experience being in lockdown for that long. But I think to me, looking at what's happening in aged care is that it's in a way revealing, just like last year, the existing flaws that existed prior to COVID. And by that, I mean, a lot of the time it's aged care workers that are underpaid and as a result have to take on multiple part-time or casual positions. And although state aged care centres don't allow their workers to, to, to go to different facilities, the mm. federal government centres do. But I think what that goes to show is that the ongoing lack of fair pay really for those working in aged care means that they have to move between these centres. Yeah. You know, that's not a choice for fun. That's not something you know, enjoyable. It's something that they have to do to make ends meet. So I think there needs to be not only more government support and enough money for aged care workers to stay with one centre and one facility, but maybe this is something we can even continue after COVID to actually make it fair and equitable payment all round. Mm. It's exposed many kind of fault lines in terms of when it comes to casual and insecure work. Now, we're going to come back to the question of aged care with our guest Anne Connolly. But before we do, Prue Goward, one of the questions is, what is the federal government's responsibility when it comes to providing assistance to Victorians? We've seen a more um, vehement request for help, um, even though it's just a week or it could be longer. Where, where, where are their obligations here? Well, um, when it comes to aged care, aged care is a. Oh, when it, no, when it, so when it comes to to job keeper, we're going to get to aged care in a moment. But when it comes oh. to to assisting the state in general, 
Um, look, I think it's a very difficult one because um, I think the, the federal government wants to be clear about how much of this is the responsibility of Victoria and how much of this is the nature of the virus and the game it's playing with our heads and our systems. I mean, I read the Royal Commission's report last year into that first um, terrible lockdown and it was a horrifying um, analysis of poor governance, poor accountability, lack of transparency. Um, I remember at the time Dan Andrews was absolutely adamant that he would reform all their systems, require minutes at meeting, meetings of executives, uh, require uh, ministers to meet with their department heads. I mean, things that you would think actually might just happen, but uh, obviously needed to uh, be drawn to his attention that, I mean, these were, these were weaknesses in their system. So really, uh, uh, to me, uh, the federal government's got two problems. First of all, they are all Australian citizens and uh, there are going to be terrible uh, economic um, crashes uh, and uncertainties for Victorians for many months to come because um, after the fourth time, there'd be a lot of people from other states in Australia who will be very gun-shy about booking anything in Victoria. Uh, and, of course, um, likewise for Victorians organising events. So um, I certainly think the ongoing impact is, is going to be quite profound this time. And the federal government clearly needs to address that because Victoria is such an important part of the economic engine room of Australia. But it's also got to be clear about accountability and whether or not the uh, Victorian government did uh, meet some of those requirements, those many recommendations made by the judge last year. And if the Victorian government did not uh, take into, a, into, in, into hand its clearly poor governance, which Dan Andrews agreed was poor governance, then I don't blame the feds for being a bit annoyed that we're now back there again. Uh, and Victorians in the meantime might not have done what they said that they would do. So I've mm. got more questions than answers on this, um, Julia, mm. but I do think it's a bit early to just blame the feds for not giving them the money. They, I mean, they have to do something because, as I say, it's such an important engine room, but they also need to understand where does the responsibility of the Victorian government that undertook very big reforms last sure. year as a result of the last lockdown um, to actually uh, make it clear that they have met their undertakings. I mean, I couldn't get over the um, difficulties they were having with contact tracers. I mean, mm -hmm. in New South Wales, there's sort of this army on standby that just steps in the moment um, you need uh, a large number of contact tracers. And I would have thought that would be true in Victoria too, but it didn't appear to have been. Nazim Hussain, you are our man on the ground there today. I mean, is this a sense of, OK, here we go again, but once we actually work out that there are these structural issues and, and the problems that were identified that haven't been fixed, is it, is it kind of Victorians who've been so resolute about this will move more to a sense of frustration or, or, or concern? Yeah, look, I think Victorians, we don't really, you know, we're not so much as... We're not fussed about whose fault it is. At the moment, we're like... Here we go again. We've done this three other times. We know what to do. It's like an old coat, just putting it back on again. But it sucks. I mean, it's not easy. People are losing work. People's mental health is affected. Uh, you can't make plans. These lockdowns are supposed to be a temporary measure until there is a long-term solution, which is a vaccinated population. Um, we've now got vaccines. They should have been out. People should have been vaccinated in larger numbers than they have been at the moment. Why haven't... Uh, Why well, haven't people in nursing homes been vaccinated? People that work there. The federal government, if they want to at least look good, they should have done that, let alone do the right thing and vaccinate people in, in aged care. Like, it's just, it's, yep. it's just ridiculous. Yep. And also, job, like, why isn't the federal government helping? I don't care whose fault it is technically or whose responsibility it is, but Victorians are struggling. We can't work. If, the, if Scott Morrison is serious and meant what he said about doing everything he can, he said that today, well, give us some friggin' money. Mm. Right. We've raised a very good question about um, aged care. So let's bring in ABC journalist Anne Connolly. She's been following aged care developments and she joins us on the panel now. And can you explain how did we get to this point where not all aged care workers are vaccinated and not all residents are vaccinated? Well, I mean, this really has... It, it is quite amazing that we are in this situation again, considering, you know, 650 people died in aged care in the last outbreak. You know, that was 80% of the total death toll. Um, the way that this 
vaccine program has been rolled out by the government has changed all the time and there's been a lot of, uh, not a lot of information on it. But I do know one thing, I mean, go, I've been going back through the Department of Health um, information and as late as March the federal government was saying we're going to vaccinate aged care workers here on site at, at your primary workplace. Right. Now that stopped, that just didn't happen. So aged Do we care know why? Well, there's some suggestion about whether there was a problem with supply. Mm -hmm. um, there's another suggestion which is because there's an after effect sometimes with the vaccine that if you're, all of the workers are sick that they can't care for people. But at the same time, providers were waiting a really long time to get someone to come because it's been private contractors who've gone out to do this. It hasn't been run through the state health departments which mm -hmm are the ones that always do the flu vaccination, which would have made a lot of sense. Yeah. So instead you've got private contractors who've never done anything like this before, possibly problems with supply, and then you're dealing with people who maybe, I mean, the, the general population doesn't have a great understanding of what the problems are with the vaccine, and then you take into account elderly people, some who don't have family to advocate for them, and also workers, some of whom are from non-English speaking backgrounds who also have hesitancy around it. It really hasn't been handled well at all. What is, what is your understanding around the figures? We haven't had a lot of transparency on this. We did have Greg Hunt saying in his press conference today that 100% of facilities have now been vaccinated. Well, I've been trying to drill down into those figures as well. And it looks like there's been about... I specifically asked how many residents, and they said about 150,000. Now, I think there's about 250,000. I, I could be wrong about this. It could be about 190. But either way, you're talking about um, a, maybe at least 30,000 or so people who haven't been vaccinated in aged care. They say it's about 15%. Now, from what I understand, the way that Greg Hunt was talking about it, he was actually trying to suggest that there was hesitancy and that residents had actually declined to have it. Uh, which I think is probably rather unfair if you're talking about people who don't have relatives or also might be at the end of life, mm. also may have diabetes and therefore Dementia. there's a contrary yep. indications of it. Yeah. yeah, and people with cognitive decline who, who can't possibly consent. So mm. I think that there's been such a series of mistakes and none of it has been... Um, now the government is trying to catch up because they're, they're desperately caught because it's happening again. It's just hard to believe it's happening again. Now, as you've said, the, the, there was an understanding that the, the workers there would be vaccinated on site. This stopped. And now I want to ask you about what the process is for them now because this has been the major question for authorities is whether aged care workers are receiving enough support to get vaccinated. Now, take a look at this guidance for workers from the federal government. Throughout the aged care rollout, workers can get a Pfizer vaccine where doses are available following the vaccination of residents. It goes on to say that workers who get a first dose on the day that residents are receiving their second dose will have to procure their own second vaccine with no support from authorities. That seems like a kind of convoluted process for someone who's juggling shift work and... So, in the first instance, it's incredible that it's only if there's leftover vaccines available for workers. So that's the only way that they'll get them on site. Otherwise, they have to go through the exact same process that we all go through, which, as we know, has been convoluted and difficult to get into. Mm. Um, in terms of that, the second dose, they're talking about if, if, if a worker gets vaccinated at this time when the residents are getting their second dose, you will have to find it elsewhere. If you got the first dose, you can also get the second dose at that site as well. So it's a case of, but equally, they still have to find their way to making sure that they can get in. And also they have to jump a queue. They have to actually make it clear that they're an aged care worker. So there's nothing in place specifically for, like our healthcare workers who went to hospital, went to work, went to the public hospitals, queued up and were vaccinated. That just hasn't happened with the aged care workforce. Mm. Um, Carly, when you, hear about this and the kind of the, the vulnerable population that's that still seems to be exposed a decent segment of it what do you what how do you respond oh it's just it's really sad it's kind of really hard to believe that we're back in this situation and i think that from the last outbreaks and you know all the things that were happening in in melbourne you think that i don't know things would have been done to stop us from getting here so i think it's kind of like I don't know, it's, just, it's really, really sad and I think there just probably needs to be someone with just, I don't know, a little bit of decent common sense just to come in and say, you know, like, what is happening here and let's just 
make it easier, particularly for those healthcare workers um, in those aged care facilities, as we do know that they're the most vulnerable. So we really need to look after our old people. It's, it's really scary. Mm. And Prue, what about the question of workers aren't meant to be moving across multiple sectors, but it's not mandatory, mm -hmm. it's just mm -hmm. suggested, and it's also, you know, there. Are, as Yasmin was saying earlier, there's a lot of structural issues with yeah. casual and insecure, insecure work. No, I agree. I mean, the, the Feds have always found service delivery so difficult. Um, for all the obvious reasons in a big sort of disparate country like ours. And um, I think this is, you know, that, gosh, there'll be some screaming going on in Canberra. Um, I mean, those forms that uh, we've just referred to, they, they do seem to be very muddled. Um, and yes, I certainly think that workers, um, because if they're in the aged care sector and for, for economic or whatever reason, really, they work in more than one uh, facility, you would have thought that they were as much a priority uh, as the residents. So um, I think there's there's lots of um, lessons that can be learned from this. But I think we also need to be uh, aware that, that there would be contracts with the uh, with each of the um, uh, res residential care providers and the Commonwealth. I mean, they're monitored and registered and um, managed by the Commonwealth. So it's also important to know why was it only was it, was it only these aged care homes where not everybody had been vaccinated and where there were workers who weren't vaccinated? Or is this a problem throughout the uh, Australian aged care sector? We, we don't know those answers no. and it could well be, be a reflection on the particular relationship and contractual understanding of the this company, this aged care company uh, and the government. Um, Anne, if it's mandatory for healthcare workers to have vaccinations, why not aged care workers? Well, that is a good question. There's a belief that um, that there is a lot of people in there who would not like to be vaccinated. They are fearful of it. Yep. As I said, different cultural backgrounds. Um, they don't want to um, scare workers away. If they make it mandatory, you would think about potentially people not doing it. Yep. So oh, I, miss, I misspoke, by the way. It's not. It's it's mandatory for hotel quarantine. But not healthcare and aged workers. That's right. But, yeah. but so it's why encouraged. do we make that distinction there? Well, apparently, because the fear is that if you do something, I mean, I, I don't believe the unions are absolutely in favour of making it mandatory. They and the AHPCC says that they believe that um, they would get a better result by encouraging it. But there's a very different process: encouraging it and and making it available mm. and easily mm. accessible, and Both encouraging doctors. it and saying please find your own way and join the queue like everybody else are two different things. So, and, and also, I mean, I just want to make the point, apparently, Greg Hunt said in a press conference today that about 70,000 workers have been vaccinated now and that's about 20% of the workforce. So that's nothing. If they had actually spent their time and effort actually vaccinating the aged care workers who do work across sites because they're often casual, they don't make enough money, etc., mm. then this problem that had been the priority because that's how it started last time. It was aged care workers working across sites, living in the community, coming in, and, and instead of, and, or at the same time, you know, the elderly people who are vulnerable. But it, it just seems like such a missed opportunity and I can't imagine how families and, and staff and the residents are feeling. It must be terrible. Mm. I really appreciate you bringing your expertise to the show again tonight. Thank you, Anne, who follows this in depth for such a long time. Thanks so much to our guest, Anne Connolly, for joining us. Former Attorney General Christian Porter has discontinued his defamation case against the ABC. You might remember that Mr Porter announced he would sue the public broadcaster and journalist Louise Milligan over an article alleging an unnamed cabinet minister had been accused of rape in January 1988 in a dossier sent to Scott Morrison and three other MPs. Although Mr Porter was not named, he identified himself as the subject of the article after a period of media scrutiny and strenuously denied the allegations. I don't think this article ever should have been printed and published in the way that it was. It was sensationalist, it was one-sided, it was unfair, and it's the sort of reporting that any Australian could be subject to unless people stand up to it. So I brought an action to stand up to that sort of reporting. And the ABC said now they regret the article. Why isn't it being taken down? 
Well, that rarely, if ever, happens in these matters. No damages will be paid, but the ABC has added this editor's note to the original article. The ABC did not intend to suggest that Mr Porter had committed the criminal offences alleged. The ABC did not contend that the serious accusations could be substantiated to the applicable legal standard, criminal or civil. However, both parties accept that some readers misinterpreted the article as an accusation of guilt against Mr Porter. That reading, which was not intended by the ABC, is regretted. Prue Goward, both sides claiming that they've not, not, not exactly victory, but seeming pleased with this outcome. Mm -hmm. How do you see it? Oh, look, defo cases for public figures, particularly politicians, I mean, as court cases have found over the years, very difficult to win. I think they should uh, both be quite pleased with the resolution. Uh, I, I myself don't think it will help a Christian Porter ever become uh, Attorney General again, uh, or, you know, he will probably struggle to sit on a bench. But um, I certainly think it's a resolution. I mean, it's interesting that the uh, South Australian coroner, after months and months, has not made a decision about whether there will be a coronial inquiry uh, into these allegations, which again confirms the paucity of the evidence and the, the difficulty of uh, even meeting it to the standard of a, of a coronial inquiry. So um, it was never going to end in joy for anybody. I think this is a good outcome. I think it gives Porter uh, something to stand on. Um, but I certainly think that he would not probably have done very well in court, given the uh, history of, of defo cases and uh, public figures, particularly MPs, who I just we're, we're just as I was as a former minister, often told when I wanted to sue, um, you won't win, um, and uh, you're a public figure, and you're supposed to take it. Mm. Now, Yasmin, one thing that the um, that Christian Porter was saying today, he said repeatedly, the ABC has said that this could not be proven, the allegations could not be proven in a you know to a civil or criminal level. Um, although there is a there is a subtle distinction there, the, the, according to the um, statement, the ABC they're saying the ABC did not contend that the serious ac accusations could be substantiated to the uh, applicable legal standard, criminal or civil. Either or, this has been a hugely symbolic debate, like coming in the context of a big discussion around the, around the treatment of women, around uh, you know a culture in Canberra. Um, where does it leave us in terms of that debate? Mm, I think it, it's hard to know where exactly it leaves us because I think a lot of it is in the hands of the decision makers right now to take action and recognise that this is not only a once off, twice off, you know, three times, it is an endemic problem that often women are targeted um, and harassed. And even that extends all the way up to female leaders that can experience sexual you know, harassment or can experience sexism in the workplace, for example. But mm. I think the outcome in this instance gives me some level of comfort that there is still opportunity for survivors and for women that are victims of sexual assault to step forward and to share their story. And I think what we've seen in recent months is the power of women coming forward and saying, this happened to me and you can't sweep this under the rug. And I have power because I'm able to share my story. And we saw how, you know, at least in the beginning when Brittany Higgins came forward, that led to a wave and a movement of women taking to the streets, women marching on Parliament House demanding to finally be heard and for decision makers to take action. Mm -hmm. And I was one of the women that was part of that protest and seeing the wave of people, you know, championing their support. I remember Brittany Higgins standing up in front of the crowd wearing white and it was this moment of symbolism. So I think we really can't let decision makers use legal systems in this way to try mm. to silence the press. Because I think the opportunity that the media provided in this instance is that in this overwhelming institutional barriers that women can face, especially in parliament, the way that women are often gaslighted, the way that they, again, the issues are swept under the rug for political reasons. It's really powerful if they're able to tell their story in their own words. Mm. And I can't really express how transformative it is that young women got to see this movement because I think 
going, you know, growing up and looking at the societal messages around us, it's often, you know, that we're told to just be quiet and to just say nothing and not rock the boat. But if there's something that it showed me, it's that women are really powerful when we rally together and when we support one another. Mm. So I'm really hoping that in coming years, there's there's action taken, but also to make, to, I guess, to keep this momentum, to keep this struggle and to keep this fight. Right. And within the context of this debate, you've raised, you've raised a number of accusations or allegations or things that women have said have occurred. And we obviously do need to repeat again that Christian Porter has strenuously denied these allegations at every stage of the discussion. But I want to return to some of the things that young women have put on the agenda uh, later in the program when we talk about consent. But for now, I want to talk about something else, which is that there is one thing that Australians seem to agree on, which is that racism remains a big problem in this country. In fact, this admission is one of the more widely agreed upon responses in the ABC's Australia Talks. It's a survey of 60,000 people on everything from coronavirus to how often we change our sheets. In the latest results, 76% of respondents agree there is still a lot of racism in Australia, while a solid 61% of people confirm that they have a friend relative or workmate who tells racist jokes. Of all respondents, only 20% had personally experienced discrimination on the grounds of ethnicity. But when you ask only Aussies of non-European ancestry, this rate soars. 76% from this group report being discriminated against. Now, the survey also interrogated our perspectives of Indigenous Australians. 68% felt that Australia needs to do more to address past and current injustices against Indigenous people. Nazim, what does this mean? Three quarters of us still think there is a lot of racism here. Does this, does this response surprise you at all? Well, uh, I mean, it's, it, it doesn't surprise me, but it surprises... Well, it's, it's, it is news to a lot of people. I think the news is that, well, often when you tune into the public conversation, whenever racism is discussed, uh, whether it's by media professionals or politicians, um, it's always it's always debated as to whether or not racism exists. Is racism a thing in Australia? Is Australia a racist country? It's always like a, you know. Whereas for for years we've known, and clearly this this survey proves that most of us just know racism exists, and not just that it exists, but that there is a lot of it in community. And uh, more than that, we need to do something about it. There's a growing sentiment amongst Australians. 68% uh, of Australians think we need to do more to address the injustices, past and present, uh, that Indigenous Australians face. So, um, mm. yeah, whether or not our policy outcomes reflect that right. momentum and that change is a separate question. But on the ground, yeah. Australians, this is not news to most people. How, what, what kind of impact do you think that the Black Lives Matter movement has had on this? I think it's had a, it's, well, it's, it, it occurred between the last survey and this survey, yeah. and I think it's had a, um, a, a, a big impact. In fact, I think 59% yeah, of the respondents of the 60,000 people that did the survey agreed that Black Lives Matter had an important contribution to the conversation about racial injustice. So it has overwhelmingly um, been a positive thing, and most Australians recognise that, whether they were actively involved or not, they saw the value of it. I was also interested, um, people were asked for their views on white supremacy. They were asked uh, about whether white supremacy is ingrained in most aspects of Australian society. Mm. And then it was more split. 46% agreed, 44% agreed, and it very much di it differs politically. It's like a partisan response to that. Do you think people, like, it, it under fully understand what white supremacy means? I'm not too sure whether, you know, um, you know, how much the respondents understood what white supremacy meant and how it manifests itself in different parts of society and in, 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 in the way that we live. But, but a separate question asked uh, if, if, if people think white people have an unfair advantage in Australia and 57% of respondents said yes. So more than half of us think white people do have an unfair advantage over the rest of us. So the white supremacy question, you know, what you can argue about whether or not people um, understood understand what white supremacy is but most people do walk around thinking that white people have it a little easier in this country yeah. um, but as I said there is a growing sentiment that we need to do something about that about that sort of inequity um, which is which is really promising I feel like this survey has provided us with lots of opportunities to take that to decision makers and to culture makers and go look most of us want to do something so now it's your turn 
uh, to do something about to that and start to make some changes. This this sentiment. Um, Kylie, of like of all of respondents, only one in five had said they'd personally discriminated, mm -hmm. um, experienced discrimination. But of course, that changes when you ask Australians of non-European ancestry. It was like four mm -hmm. in five then. Um, did that did that resonate with you? Do you think that's an accurate reflection? Oh, look, I think that there's, um, I think even just reflecting on the whole um, survey and mm. the statistics and things that were raised, I think I feel quite um, happy. I really feel like these past few years and of recent, you know, of late, a lot of these issues are coming to the surface and that people, Australians, are actually admitting that, you know, that there is racism in Australia. And I think that that just goes to show that I think there's more education happening. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think there's a whole lot that we need to, to you know, to do with that and um, just to really acknowledge, you know, that it's, it is a thing. And I think for me personally, as a proud Aboriginal woman, you know, I've been in Aboriginal identified positions for a long time now and I often feel like Nazim said, you know, like I've, it's kind of like we're, we're always kind of, um, you know, just fighting and um, trying to justify and, and educate people about things that we're, we're seeing and, you know, and it's not just for Aboriginal people, it's from people from all race, but, you know, I, I think I'm just really, really happy to see that, um, that people are being honest within their surveys, um, that the, mm. the racism fact has actually come out and um, now moving forward, what are we going to do? And I, you know, as, as a proud and passionate educator, I really feel that it just starts with education. I think that Australia has a lot to um, kind of learn, unlearn, relearn mm. around the history of this country. Mm. And even just going back to that old, you know, saying of, you know, like, don't judge a book by its colour, mm. you know, by, by the cover. Um, it's, it's really important that we, that we don't judge people. And I think, if anything, it's raised that awareness about the fact that it is still here. And for me, um, you know, being an Aboriginal woman, I grew up within my Aboriginal communities and people would look at me and they say, oh, well, you know, you don't look Aboriginal. But, you know, if I didn't actually own a mirror, I would feel just as Aboriginal and just as black as, you know, my nan and my family. And I have felt that, you know, with I've got nephews and nieces who are really dark and we go through the shopping centres and um, often when it's myself and my own children, people don't look twice at me. But if I have my nephews with me who are, look Aboriginal, really, really dark, we often get, you know, we're getting followed around in the shopping centres and, you know, I just think that um, this survey and, you know, everything that's been discussed, I think it's great. I really think that um, it's all about that truth telling, um, you know, over these last few years and hopefully this has come to the surface and we'll actually do something about it. Mm -hmm. Yasmin, how important do you think it is to have this data? Oh, it's so essential. I think there's a real actual lack of measurement often around what exactly racism looks like in Australia. And I think the difference as well is that often, and I guess in this instance, we're talking about maybe obvious racism and obvious discrimination, but a lot of the time racism exists on a structural level, you know, systemic discrimination that leads to disproportionate outcomes that harm, for example, people of colour in Australia. And I think it's quite interesting to look at the data that 20% of Australians have reported discrimination versus 76% of non-European heritage mm. because to me it shows that often people of colour in Australia have to constantly prove it time and time again that racism still does exist and it's going back to that question like Nazim asked, is Australia a racist country? Instead of thinking about how can we actually reform our systems and institutions to address that inequality. And it's I think of, for example, well, for example, Scott Morrison talking about how Australia is the most successful multicultural nation on earth, but doesn't ever put himself in the shoes of, let's say, a South Sudanese refugee who is maybe in an over-policed community and subject to racial discrimination. So I think when we think about these issues, it's important to look at, for example, those in higher leadership, you know, does that look like the society that I can walk around in and see every day and it doesn't? Mm -hmm. So when we look at, for example, politics or people in power and in business, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, why is it that people of colour don't have the same representation in those leadership roles? And I think that comes down to a myriad of issues. It could be barriers to how you're perceived as a leader. It could be economic and financial hardship. It could, it could be a whole different variety of reasons. But I think also reframing it to think about systems is maybe a really powerful right. opportunity instead of trying to prove, you know, time and time again the racism exists. So, right, right, right. Nazim, you're wanting to jump in before. No, I was just going to say that I think, you know, uh, we often see leaders uh, just try to deny that racism exists or that it's a problem or that, oh, we boast about Australia being a great multicultural society, which is good. We should all be encouraged by that sentiment. But I think something needs to follow that. Like, it's, it's okay to talk about racism. In fact, that's what we should be doing. We should be trying to solve our problems. Um, in fact, the Ordinary Aussie, and this is a survey across 60,000 people, mm -hmm. not just social justice warriors online or Twitter. These are ordinary Australians across Australia. It's a very, if you speak to academics, 
They go nuts about how much you can rely on this sort of study. Fifty-one <laughs> percent of respondents say that there there is a, a major problem of racism with with Australia's uh, uh, ju criminal justice system. So mm. we look at our criminal justice system. Most Australians reckon there's something wrong with it. That there's racism. Only twenty-five percent said disagreed with that statement. Mm. So you know, most Australians n know racism when they see it. Yeah, it's our leaders right. that sort of refuse to take it uh, take it head on and really do something about it. Absolutely, and I might even just add to that as well. You know that that criminal justice system. You know, from an Aboriginal perspective, I mean, our statistics are absolutely appalling. You know, you look at our juvenile justice centres. You know, like uh, the overrepresentation of our Aboriginal youth in 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 prisons. Um, you know, it's just horrible, and I really feel a lot of it as well comes down to that racial profiling. You know, I know I've got you know community members that can't even walk down the street. You know, without getting pulled over by the police and getting questioned or you know they look twice at them you know because of the color of their skin so yep. you know I just think that there's we need to do something about it goes it. back like, to the yeah, systemic that's issue right. and to, yeah, kind of Canberra to, to recognize this kind of groundswell yeah. of the majority of Australians I'll, all right we I also oh, wanted to just sorry, quickly, we, oh, sorry, we need Julia. to move on yeah. now I'm so sorry no there is so much to discuss here though you're right but I just want to say look if you want to see how your views compared to other Australians just head to australiatalks.abc.net AU forward slash survey. And don't forget to tune in for a special TV event hosted by Annabelle Crabb and our Nazim Hussain. Unpacking all of this and more on Monday, June 21. So you're watching The Drum with me on the panel, wellbeing advisor at the New South Wales Department of Education, Kylie Captain, former Sex Discrimination Commissioner and New South Wales Minister Prue Goward in Melbourne, comedian and broadcaster Nazim Hussain, <coughs> and in Canberra, Youth Ambassador Yasmin Paul. Now, you may have heard last week that the New South Wales government announced historic changes to sexual assault laws. The state adopting an affirmative consent model, meaning you have to get consent before moving forward with a sexual act. Now, along with that comes changes to the way consent is taught in schools. We're also working through at the moment a review of the resources that are available to all of our teachers and making that much easier for them to access, putting everything together in one place, uh, lesson plans, sample assessments, ways that it can be really clear that the information that is going out to our students in schools through our PDHPE curriculum around matters related to consent uh, is simple, it's easy for teachers to use and it's an easier message to get across to students. New South Wales MPs will also be asked to debate whether the education material should include information on slut shaming, toxic masculinity and rape culture. Now this overhaul is the culmination of a petition started by former Sydney student Chanel Contos, which detailed thousands of testimonies from current and former students of sexual harassment and assault at high school. And to tell us more, Chanel Contos joins us on the panel from London. Good morning and welcome back, Chanel. Good morning or good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Now, first of all, after all the work that you've put into this, what do you make of the announcement by the New South Wales government when it comes to sexual education in schools? So, I mean, it's always great that it's at the forefront of issues and I think it's really important that the government is understanding the necessity for both teacher resources and surveys um, to measure success. However, it's missing the mark because there's still a denial about the adequacy of our consent education where it could not be more clear that there is still a problem here. And when we're measuring success in how often the resources are being accessed, um, we're not looking at the actual problem, which is sexual assault. We should be measuring the success of consent curriculum by the reduction of sexual violence in our country. Um, and on top of that, I understand, um, from my understanding, it's going to be PDHP experts and school experts who will be um, accumulating this curriculum and support packages for teachers. However, we have a problem there where these same people went through our Australian cur curriculum school system without um, adequate consent education either. Mm -hmm. So what we need to be doing is turning to academics, people who have masters, people who have PhDs in this area, and Australia has ample of them and those are who we should be engaging in creating these teacher packages at the same time the curriculum still needs reform. So you think it's too timid and it's putting too much pressure on on teachers to suddenly be experts in sexual consent? I think that we we do change curriculum for students it is so important to support teachers in that process because 
Unfortunately, there's still lots of taboos around this topic. And we know from research that the curriculum can be, you know, as good as it wants, but it's ultimately how that one person in front of that room of students delivers that content. Um, so we do need more support for teachers. And I don't think online resources curated by other teachers is necessarily the best way to do that. Mm. I also want to ask you about the changes to the consent laws that were announced by Mark Speakman last week. And in particular, because one of the things you've, you've spoken about so clearly is the, the problem of rape culture and the prevalence of rape myths. And he gave, uh, there are five ins new instructions to be going out to juries, which I, I meant to read out, read out on air last week. Um, and these directions are that, you know, sexual assault can occur in many situations with acquaintances or with people you're in relationships with. Um, they're not always... It, sexual assault isn't always accompanied by violence or threats. And there's no t normal or typical response to being sexually assaulted. It may affect people differently. So when they're giving evidence, some people may be emotional, some people may be not at all. And finally, it can't be assumed that the way a person is dressed or the fact they've consumed alcohol or drugs indicates their consent. How, how do you assess those as kind of very targeted attempts to shift our thinking around consent? I think it's a great idea. And, you know, when I hear those read out to me, it's almost laughable that anyone could ever imagine that the way someone is dressed is um, that consent um, can be given from that. But I think that... I think that clearly laying that out um, to a jury and more importantly, when I spoke to Mark Speakman about the announcement and he said, um, along with this announcement of law reform will result in obviously an education package being delivered to students and the public around New South Wales to educate them on the new laws. It's, you know, it gets us halfway there in this whole debate because half the problem is it used to be no means no and now it's yes means yes. And all those five things are really important things to understand. Mm. And they're all very victim blaming in nature. And now we are going to be educating the whole of society mm. um, that that, in fact, is not the case um, and not productive. Um, I want to bring um, in the rest of the panel in here now, and particularly Prue Gower, because when you were Minister for Women, I mean, this is something that was, you know, in your bailiwick and something that you had concerns about, right? The consent legislation. That's right. What, what, mean, what do you some... make of them? Yes. Well, Mark Speakman and I, were the, we referred this to the, Australian, to the New South Wales Law Reform Commission uh, to see whether the consent laws could be strengthened. So I very much welcome uh, this outcome. I would say that we have to remember it's the beginning of the discussion. Uh, it seems to me that there's a big risk that if we reduce sex, particularly for young people, uh, to a transactional uh, matter, uh, and it might be for boys, but for girls, it, it, they, they, I think, see it differently. They're much more interested in relationships, for example. We should see this as the beginning of courtship uh, and sometimes you wouldn't even ask this question until you're well into developing a relationship with somebody and and remember that, that a lot of this is to counter the incredible role that pornography now role plays in the sex education particularly of young boys and i would say girls watching porn with their friends um, can also think that women can have orgasms in 30 seconds just whatever he is doing to her, uh, and that there doesn't need to be any notion of uh, liking or affection. In fact, there can be quite a lot of uh, control and coercion in, in pornography, as we know. So um, if we're going to counter the impact that I think pornography is having, I mean, I don't know, we don't know this, we haven't researched it properly, but I think that's not a bad guess. If, we, if we're going to do this as part of countering the impact of pornography, then the poor old teachers have got a much bigger challenge than just talking about it. you've got to make sure that there is an affirmative yes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's as much about, and by the way, um, sexual relationships between you and your friends and who you wish to have sex with is much more complicated than just asking for sex. There's got to be a whole lot of other things and respect and affection that should be going along with that, that make everybody feel comfortable and that both parties can um, get joy out of this encounter, uh, not just one. So it's the beginning, it's a, it's a very so good start, to discuss. my goodness, there's a long way to go. Right, and, and Yasmin, I know you wanted to talk about gender roles when it comes to consent. Tell us why. 
Well, I think a necessary part, and I mean, just going back to the comments before, maybe pornography does play some element, but it certainly doesn't drive this culture. For example, gendered sexual abuse has, has existed for <laughs> generations, really, um, against women. So I think often when we're having these conversations, and from what I've heard, often young men can feel defensive, angry, upset that they feel like I'm being blamed for something that I don't do. You know, I'm not a predator. Why am I being treated in this way? And I think what we also need on then on top of consent, because we have to realise that it isn't just about consent, there's also power dynamics and gendered power dynamics at play, is that it's also important to have conversations with young men about things like masculinity. And after speaking with young men, I hear that there's an overwhelming expectation that young men are meant to be alpha, expected to know all the all, no, all the answers are expected to sleep with the most girls and this, this really masculine, you know, sexualized culture, which is, can often be confusing for, for young men. And I think that can be especially endemic in, for example, private boys' schools where a lot of this sexual abuse took place. Mm. So as much as, you know, consent education is essential, it's also important to challenge that. But also, I just wanted to point out that, for example, with the conversation that we're having, that was driven by young women. For example, you know, Chanel's petition mm. on the way to enthusiasm consent with Saxton Mullins. So it's really essential that when we talk about these programs that schools and parents and educators are listening to young women because I think a lot of this stuff has existed for a really long time so you have to wonder have schools been listening? Have it's, parents been listening? Right. And I think we need to do that better. It's a huge cultural change that you, that you guys have been, have, have been part of. Naseem, uh, uh, and, and are blokes listening to this too? How do we have that conversation? I mean, I think you should teach consent and, uh, you know, as early as we can. Um, in the classroom, we talk about being nice to each other, respecting others, other people in their personal space and their property. We should be speaking about consent as early as children understand that they're their own person. You can't just go up and hug someone. Someone can't just come up to you and hug you. You know, I see that go on with family, friends and their children, um, they ask their kids if they're comfortable giving a hug to an uncle. Or, you know, I think you can start conversations as early as children understand that they are separate from somebody else. Um, I don't see it being a problem talking about consent when kids might not even understand what sex is. I think we just need to change culture um, yeah. from, as, from as young as age as we can. Right, around bodily autonomy. Chanel, before you, we lose you, can you tell us, I know you're going to be meeting with the Prime Minister. Can you tell us like, how that came about and what you plan to say to him? Yeah, so I emailed his media advisor a few months ago and um, didn't hear back with a confirmation, just heard back with a, um, we'll think about it basically. And then uh, two weeks ago, I held a briefing with members of federal parliament, um, which was a really productive hour long conversation um, where I, kind of from a youth's perspective, gave a sense of the problem we're dealing with and then also using expert opinion and academic research provided um, answers to each of those problems. Um, and following that briefing, I believe politicians um, must have told um, Prime Minister Scott Morrison to meet with me because a few hours after that, I received an email um, from his EA saying that he would be willing to meet which is amazing and the type of content I'm going to be speaking to him about is exactly what I was saying in my federal briefing because basically the thing is with this situation is we know exactly how to reduce sexual assault experts and academics and women's groups knows, know exactly how to reduce violence against women and to create a more respectful culture to everyone this has been something that women have been working on for decades all we need to do is for it to become a priority in policy, legislation, and resource allocation and education. The answers are there, we just need to execute them as solutions. So I'm really just going to be lobbying for obvious here. We've been working incredibly hard. So thank you so much, Chanel, for giving us some more of your time mm -hmm. and we'd love to have you back on again so that, to let us know how it's going. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, enjoy your London day. Thanks to our guest, Chanel Contos, for joining us again. Now, a common refrain when we talk about Indigenous history is we were never taught this at school. And that might be because this history hasn't always been taught. In fact, as recently as 2014, there was a call for greater focus on Western civilization and so-called Judeo-Christian values. <clears throat> 
But the pendulum may have swung back, with educators now pushing for an emphasis on First Nations perspectives of the European arrival and describing the experience of colonisation as an invasion. Here's the drums, Ruby Cornish. OK, which way is the camera? Have we got a school camera here? In 2010, Australia got its first national curriculum. What we're on about is making sure that the absolute basics of knowledge, the absolute basics of education, are taught right across the country. Year seven. Its implementation was staggered. Education has traditionally been a domain of states and territories, and not all of them were enthusiastic about the national framework. Kristen, you're in year six, are you? Okay, very good. In 2014, the year New South Wales became the last jurisdiction to finally sign up to the new curriculum, the Abbott government commissioned a review into it, including the way history was being taught. I don't think uh, that Western civilization uh, is being given the uh, pride of place that it should alongside other aspects of the history curriculum. In their final report, the two government-appointed reviewers agreed. One of their 30 recommendations called for greater recognition of Western civilization's contribution to the development of Australia. The freedoms we have in Australia are derived from our Western civilization, and Christianity, uh, our Judeo-Christian tradition, is also very important. But the most recent review, which began in June last year, has changed focus again, this time with renewed attention on First Nations perspectives. So what's one of the examples from the Aboriginal culture? An advisory committee examining the way Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures is taught found that many ideas were outdated and did not include enough truth-telling. A decade ago, we would say that Aboriginal perspectives were really um, invisible and mute in the curriculum. And truth-telling, uh, you know, particularly from a statement from the heart, is uh, a, a, a contemporary uh, focus for um, the whole country. Among other things, the advisory group has proposed the phrases First Nations Australians and Australian First Nations peoples be preferred over the terms Aboriginal and Indigenous, which it says are increasingly being rejected by First Nations communities. As well as acknowledging First Nations connections to country and place, the proposed curriculum would explicitly describe their experiences of colonisation as an invasion that denied them access to both. The various rights conferred by the 1993 Native Title Act would be included, and the new curriculum would acknowledge the country's first people as belonging to the world's oldest continuous cultures. I think the revisions are in sync with uh, contemporary thinking and we want to make sure the teachers of today have the correct tools for the kids of tomorrow. We want them to be able to understand competing worldviews. We want them to understand the richness of the country that they live in and to be able to view it from a number of perspectives. Feedback on the proposals will close in July. The new curriculum is expected to be finalised in September and will go live at the beginning of 2022. Now, Kylie, this is your bread and butter. This is the work that you've been doing for 15 years to help public schools like, improve the way they, you know, they teach Indigenous history. How do you go about that and how do you assess where we're at? Yeah, so we've been um, doing an amazing job. You know, I work with the Department of Education and it's all about cultural awareness training for our staff, I believe. It starts with the teachers in the classroom and fortunately enough, you know, we have these amazing policies that, that really support the work that we do and they really just highlight the fact that Aboriginal education is everybody's business. So it's not just for those schools that have those high population of Aboriginal students, it's everybody's business and it's everybody's history. It's not black history, it's not white history, it's a Australian history mm -hmm. and I really love that um, that notion of truth-telling and I really feel that these last couple of years you know with the NAIDOC themes and reconciliation themes the truth is really coming to the surface and I think for so long it's kind of been swept under the rug you know like for me I grew up you know within my Aboriginal community and with a high population of Aboriginal students um, but it wasn't until I elected to study Aboriginal studies in my senior years and then went off to university that I actually really understood you know, why my people were suffering and that intergenerational trauma is passed on from generation to generation. And you just, you look at our statistics and they're appalling, you know, um, in lots of different areas when you have a look at those Close the Gap reports. And I'm really happy and uh, I mean, we're doing an amazing work in this space about just educating the educators. And is know? that hard, giving, getting the teachers to have the confidence when they themselves might not have been 
taught properly at school. Like, you know, I went back through my history books re recently when I was in year eight and the first mention of Indigenous people was under a list of problems for squatters. Yeah, we it do. Yeah, like that no, was the and it's first appalling. Mention. You know, it's absolutely appalling and it is hard for a lot of teachers, particularly the ones that have been around for a long time, you know, and they haven't had to teach this in the past, but it is about truth telling and it's mm. in our policies. Um, and we, um, you know, with the department, we actually just go on this, you know, we've got an AECG who are our, you know, peak advisory body as well and our partnership with them. Um, it's about just educating and giving them the confidence to build relationships with their local communities and knowing that Aboriginal history and, you know, there's lots of different nations and clans right across Australia, mm. but just giving teachers the confidence to actually have a go because we are a very small population within this country and we need teachers and it's about building empathy. We find that if we can go back and educate the teachers mm. and um, they often will come and say, look, I've been teaching for you know 20 30 years and I've never thought to to really you know get excited and actually really celebrate Aboriginal history so it's not just all that sad stuff that we need to focus on it's all the rich and beautiful culture as well that's there for everyone to share so it's about you know improving their confidence and what we're seeing in the classrooms is absolutely amazing like you know it's just it's really exciting and I think that I'm hopeful that in the future um, we're not even going to be having this conversation because things really are improving. Mm. And it, a lot of it is about the framing of it, is, is, isn't it? Like it's not like the, two different kinds of history or as you're saying it's kind of it's everyone's history or, or that it's necessarily a bad or depressing history as opposed to saying everything yeah. we have to be proud of in our oldest continuous living culture of 65,000 years. Capri, Pru, Goward, you were nodding firmly when Kylie was saying this is Australian history. Why do we always get into the trap? Why do so many fall into the trap of this being like a zero-sum game? I agree. I don't know. I mean, uh, I guess the history of how we've treated Aboriginal people has been so shocking uh, that... Um, uh, for a long time, nobody was really prepared to, to discuss it. I mean, I think uh, it's very important that we tell the complete picture. Uh, and I uh, absolutely endorse the use of history and uh, culture as a way of teaching students, not just about uh, Indigenous history and culture, but about how that can be part of their um, um, their academic uh, skill development mm. so that uh, it, it's got a wider application too. But I guess the issue that worries me the most is that we have some very, as we've said, some terrible statistics about Aboriginal children, particularly um, the rate of removal of Aboriginal children, the rate of sexual assault of Aboriginal yep. children, the rate of Aboriginal suicide. I mean, there are so many serious problems. I think it's important that we make it clear that it is important that we understand and are honest about our history. Uh, but I think it's also important that we don't think that this is the panacea, that if we are honest about our history, that all these problems will go away. I would hate it to distract attention mm -hmm. from the very serious right. efforts that we really have we're to We're going to have to wrap, wrap it up there. And I know I wanted to talk to you about, well, I know that we're out of time, but you really think it's important to root it in your local community and absolutely. get to know your local community. Absolutely, that's right. Yeah, no, just, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. All right, we're going to have to unfortunately end it there. Thank you, Kylie Captain, Prue Goward, Nazim Hussain, Yasmin Poole. I hope you have an excellent evening. I'll see you very soon. Good night.